correction and training in righteousness. Don't we want that? Yeah, we need the Old Testament. Okay, so I want you just to use your imagination with me now. Because what I'm going to show you is a contract of employment. It's oversimplified, but just use your imagination, okay? So here we have a contract of employment. Let's say that you, uh, the job is, is kind of data entry, word processing, data entry. That's your job. You sit at a computer all day, staring into the screen. Uh, you start at eight, that's the agreement. And you have a coffee break, because I did this and everybody has to have half an hour coffee break. It keeps employment, employ, uh, employees sane. And then you have an hour for lunch and then you finish at 5.15. Now, this job requires five days and a Saturday morning, okay? It's work processing, you get three weeks holiday and five days over Christmas, okay? So that's straightforward. That's your job, you have this job, that's your contract you have with your company. Now, because you're a go-getter and you really are kind of into, you know, bettering yourself, you jump online and you take a, an evening class and you uh, learn how to do uh, um, computer programming. You pass, you become a computer programmer, and it so happens that your job, the same company, they want to hire a computer programmer. A job comes vacant. So you apply for that job, and you go through the interview process, and you get the job. And what happens is you enter into what? A new contract. This is your new contract. You enter the new contract, you start at 8.30, you have a coffee break at 10, and head to 10.30, lunch is at 1 to 2, finish at 5.30, it's five days a week. Nature of the work, computer programming, and look, four weeks holiday a year, seven days over Christmas and the new year, obviously they value you more. And of course, I haven't got salary there, but that's also increased. So you're a happy camper. You have a new job. Now, what I want you to do is to look at these two contracts. You have the old contract and the new contract. When you were under the old contract, you had to start at eight. But now look, you get an extra half hour in bed. Isn't that great? Oh, sorry, an extra half hour to pray. <laughs> isn't, that, isn't that great? Isn't that great? And so, and so you know, when you, when you um, sort of wake up, because you're so used to waking up uh, to get to work at the 8 o'clock time, and you look at the clock and think, oh, I've got an extra half hour, and you roll over and go back to sleep. You don't roll over feeling guilty, thinking, oh, maybe I should really be there at eight, you know. Maybe I should be really there, oh, this is just feels so bad, but, but you know, I think it says 8.30. that <laughs> no, it's 8.30. Yeah. Yeah. You're no longer under this law, are you? Because it's been replaced. It's been, it's been replaced here. Coffee break's the same. So you actually do it the same. And lunch is the same. And you finish the same. Oh, but you don't do Saturday mornings. And when Saturday comes round, you don't get up and think, oh, I feel so guilty about not going to work today. No, you don't. You think, hallelujah. I'm free from Saturday morning work. See, I'm no longer have to do it. Now, I want this just to be, a, I'm sure you can see where this is going. I want you to see this as, as a, a bit like the old covenant, the agreement, uh, but the new covenant. That new covenant that Jesus inaugurated in the upper room with 12 disciples representing Israel. He entered into a new covenant with them. And when we look at our position, we need to remember that the Old Testament law is a covenant made with ancient Israel. You need to get hold of this. That when God made the covenant at Sinai, 
He didn't make it with you. He made it with them. It is their covenant. It's not yours. Now, I have to say very quickly, in case stones come flying in my direction, <laughs> that even though it was not made with us, it is still God's word. Because all scripture is inspired of God. And of course, the Apostle Paul was talking about the Old Testament. And it is profitable. But get first, it, is, it, it, it was not made with us. It was made with them. And this distinction is helpful when it comes to us figuring out how we handle it. It's not our covenant, it's their covenant. But our covenant is the new covenant. And please understand, this can be so misunderstood because some people think that the new covenant is with the Gentiles. How many Gentiles here? Gentiles, hi Gentile. Do we have any Jews here? No, this one. It's always wonderful to have Jews. You know, you have to read this. If you don't believe me, just read it. Jeremiah 31, 31. God wasn't speaking to Gentiles. He was speaking to Israel. And he said, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I'm going to make a new covenant with the house of Judah and the house of Israel. Not like the old covenant that you broke. It's going to be a new covenant. And Jesus made that covenant uh, uh, with the 12 disciples in the upper room when he said this is my broken body and this is the cup of the covenant and when the day of Pentecost came who did it, the Holy Spirit fall on? it was Jews we, we tend to think it was international because it says they were from all the nations uh, but it was Jews from every nation under heaven they had all come from the diaspora and they were there and the Holy Spirit fell upon them and the church was a Ju the church is Jewish and it grew as a Jewish entity and for Gentiles to get in it took God a massive well of course God can do what he wants you know but, but just you know, Acts 10 with Cornelius and, and Peter and that whole incident it was like it's like God had to say to Peter Peter Hello, I'm trying to say something to you. <coughs> and he walked into the home of Cornelius and he kind of walked in and he says, now he says, you do need to know that I'm a Jew and it's not lawful for me to come into your house because I'm a Jew. I mean, you're a Gentile. But God's told me not to call you unclean. So I guess here I am. <laughs> and what happened was a new phase opened and the, the, the apostles realized that the gospel the message of Jesus the Messiah was for all the nations and that had always been on the heart of God that was what Abraham was all about all the nations of the earth will be blessed through you and it went to all the nations and so we Gentiles we have got in on the Jewish new covenant what an honor what a privilege but we're part of the new covenant that's a point I want you to get. We're going to stop in a few moments. The covenant was not for Jews only, but also for Gentiles. We participate in the new covenant that God made with the house of Judah and the house of Israel. And I've got almost the whole New Testament says this. Every book almost talks about this. And so we come, how do we apply Old Testament law material as new covenant people and you're going to have to wait for that because we're going to have a break. Um, so let's take 15 minutes um, but before we break if there's anyone that hasn't paid
check. Okay, if you guys want to finish grabbing coffee or a muffin. Mark, it's always good to see you. Thank you. Yeah, looking good, as usual. Um, well, we have a, a quick announcement before we get started. Um, I think I need Arnstein to help me with this announcement really quick. So Arnstein, would you mind just coming up here real quick and just being here with me? I just, I feel more comfortable if you were standing next to me for this next announcement. <laughs> um, it's actually Arnstein's birthday today, so we need to, uh, yes, so come on, come on up here. Yes, there he is. Um, so we are going to um, bless him by singing happy birthday to him. Oh, we have a lay. All right. Yes. Oh, wow. What a, is this a little ring, a bracelet? This is. Wow. Okay. This is how we. <laughs> Ready? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Arnstein. Happy birthday to you. Yes, if you, just got, if you guys just want to extend your hand, let's just pray for him today. Father, we thank you so much for Arnstein and, and calling him to be a part of this community for the season, Lord. I pray that you would just bless him in this year to come, Father. Lord, that it would be a year marked by your presence. It would be marked by intimacy with you. It would be marked by um, greater revelation of your word. We just thank you for him, God, and all that he brings to this community, all that he brings to this school, Father. Would you bless him today in Jesus' name? Amen. 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 Happy birthday. All right. Phil. The next break. Up to 12. Right up to 12, yeah. I was just asking about breaks. I know breaks are important because I know that if you're expecting a break and I don't give you one, then you'll break anyway. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what I want to do is give you a model of how you can look at the law of the Old Testament a covenant that was given to a group of people three and a half thousand years ago whose society was mostly agricultural and who were being adopted into a very clear religious system and how do we make that the word, of God, the word of God for us today. And how do we do it in a way that's consistent? Some of it, of course, is common sense. The problem is, sense isn't always common to everybody. And this is why we have denominations and splits and all sorts of things happening. Because people take something that they think is really foundational and, and they break away and you know the story and it's a sad one and so this is what I'm attempting to do and uh, I trust it will be something that is helpful for you uh, very very simply as you read through and as you come to application it is important that we understand what actually is going on and the best way to describe this is that you go into a time machine. You need a big imagination. 
you go in the time machine, you whiz all the way back and you try to see it, it through their eyes. And we will look at this together and, and take some examples of this. But um, because you see, once we understand how it worked for ancient Israel, that then actually gives us a platform to understand it and ask the question, okay, what does that mean uh, for me today? So we'll look at that in a few moments. Um, uh, just again, remembering 2 Timothy 3.16, uh, one of the, the first questions we ask, going back to the, the two contracts, the first question we ask, is this law restated in the New Covenant? If it's restated in the New Covenant, then it applies today to us just as much as it did to them. So it's very simple, isn't it? We're people of the New Covenant. This was the Old Covenant. The Old Covenant we read in Hebrews is no longer in existence. But God's Word is it's still God's Word. And therefore, when we see something in the New, and, and sorry, in the Old, and it's restated in the New, uh, then we know it still has something to say to us directly. So that's very simple. And that's the first thing I want to say. Uh, but, um, okay, so you've got what I've called here the moral laws. Uh, what about the food laws? Well, uh, when we think of uh, some of the Ten Commandments, you shall not kill. Now, you don't need a concordance to find out if that's in the New Testament, do you? <coughs> now, you, 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 shall, you shall not commit adultery. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not covet. Some of these things are kind of no-brainers in one sense. Uh, very straightforward. And then you get others like the food laws, the kosher food laws. And we know from what is said in, in Mark 10 that these are no longer binding on us. Because when talking about the various rituals, we have a little footnote by Mark where he says, Thus Jesus declares all foods clean. And so you do have to know your New Testament for this, of course. But, but this is the first thing, and in a sense the simplest thing. But then, okay, accepting that this is the, the simplest way to look at it, is this law restated in the new? If it is, then it still has a place for us. What about all of those that are not? How do they become God's word for us? How do they become of significance? Or do we just ignore them as irrelevant? Well, I want to suggest bearing in mind 2 Timothy 3.16 that all scripture is inspired of God and it is profitable for <coughs> uh, reproof, correction, instruction, training in righteousness. I would suggest the following. Firstly, is there anything that I can learn from this about the character of God? Now, the law may not be directly related to us, but we need to remember that everything ancient Israel had came out of the heart of a God who loved his people. And it was appropriate for their particular time and their culture and the technology that they had and the, the, the neighbours they had around them. Is there anything that I can learn about the character of God? Is there any wisdom here for me to learn from? It, it might not be a law that is restated in the noon, but if God gave it to his ancient people, maybe maybe, just maybe, he's kind of wise and knows what he's talking about and <laughs> maybe there's something we can learn and so we, we are asking that question I'm going to give examples on these things just to let you uh, so that we can see how these might work 
but what I want you to notice is what it says in Matthew 22 Matthew 22 Uh, this is one of those verses that is really uh, really helpful in this regard Matthew 22 verse 34 uh, this is when they asked Jesus what is the greatest commandment and I'm sure you know this passage very well one of them Eli asked him to test him teacher uh, what uh, which commandment of the law is greatest and he says you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your soul and with all your mind this is the first and the greatest commandment the second is like it you shall love your neighbor as yourself now I want you to notice what he says next on these two commandments hang all of the law and the prophets every law every law is basically connected to these two loving God or loving your neighbor and so I want to give you a, a uh, uh, just a little model here it's a kind of a triangle and at the top where it's the closest together you have the two laws loving God and loving your neighbor and uh, so that sums up all of the uh, apparently I haven't counted them there's 623 separate laws in the Torah and so uh, they're all there 613 when you take the Ten Commandments from that and so what you have is the two specific laws love God love my neighbor but then you ask the question how do I love God and how do I love my neighbor what does that look like well you come down and you have the Ten Commandments and the Ten Commandments are, are a, a little bit more specific aren't they of how you love God and how you love your neighbor for example you love God by not worshiping any other gods <coughs> you love God by not making any graven image you love God by not taking his name in vain you love God by remembering the Sabbath but you also love your neighbor by remembering the Sabbath you love your 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 neighbor by honoring your mother and father how many of you know that you love your neighbor by not killing them and not not sleeping with their wife or not stealing from them or not perjuring yourself in court so they are, are innocent people are are tried you see you, you you get the the more general but then you come down and you get all of these other laws and every law that you read about here is actually an application of the Ten Commandments in, specific, in a specific situation you know there's something you need to know about ancient law ancient law differs from our modern law in that in modern law you end up having a stipulation about every single possibility don't you you know law books are this thick and I know that there, there, there's case law and, and that kind of thing but so often someone can be absolutely guilty but they can get off on the technicality but in ancient Israel that, that isn't how law worked in ancient Israel what God said is that you should so get to know my law that you, it, it, you, you write it on your heart in other words you internalize it and those responsible for the law would so know the law that if they were going to court they didn't need to have Deuteronomy under their arm to refer to because it had been internalized and and it was out of what was internalized they would then be able to try different cases and, and come to different decisions and a lot of what you get here are examples situations that you read about and what they're doing are given examples of of the Ten Commandments, the applications of the Ten Commandments 
uh, which then come uh, up to loving God and loving your neighbour. And so uh, let's, let's just explore this a little bit. Um, let's just jump ahead a little bit to uh, Deuteronomy, then I'm going to jump back into Leviticus because that's where we are this morning. Let's go to Leviticus, uh, Levitic, <laughs> Deuteronomy 22. Because these are kind of those little general laws you wonder what the heck to do with. Deuteronomy 22 verse 1. You shall not watch your neighbour's ox or sheep straying away and ignore them. You shall take them back to your owner. Now, you know, the chances are you read that and you're very committed to obey the word of the Lord and you've read that in your quiet time, you think, oh dear, maybe I'm going to meet an ox today. <laughs> and so you're walking to class and you're looking for that ox that you think you might see and lead it back to your owner. Now, some of you know, I'm sure, many of you know that in some countries this law is absolutely relevant because ox is still straight and oxes represent people's wealth. And what it's saying here is if you do see your neighbour's ox or sheep stray, this is their, their wealth, you don't ignore them. You don't ignore them. Don't walk on the other side of the road. You don't say, it's not my problem. What you do is you take it back to their owner. Now, you may not have an ox, but you may be walking along the road, and what do you find? Think, wow. Wow, look, wow, look at this. I was praying for 4,000 pounds, and I have found it. <laughs> See, see, you might not find an ox, but you may find something else. And, and, and what do we do? Well, the whole point is if you find your ox, one of these laws, straying down the road, you don't steal that ox, but you love your neighbour by getting it back to them. So it may not be an ox, but it may be something else. Because, you see, in these verses, God is, is, is trying to get them to understand the kind of society he wants Israel to be. The kind of society is where there's people there supporting, helping, looking out for one another. I want to be in that kind of society, don't you? Yeah. Now, if the owner does not reside near you and, and you do not know who the owner is, you shall bring it to your own house and it shall remain with you until your owner claims it, then you should turn it to him. That is a lot of hassle. Yeah. You have to take that jolly ox to your home and you have to feed it and clean up its poo and do everything. I don't want this ox. <laughs> but you see, what you're doing is you're actually showing kindness to your neighbour because that ox belongs to someone and very surely he will come looking for it because he can't plough his field without it. Now see the alternative is you take it home and you butcher it and you have steaks for the next few weeks. No one knows. But what this is saying, so, so we may not be having oxes, this is not part of my world. But if I was walking down the street in, in the country I come from and I found a wallet with a few hundred pounds in it, then I would know exactly what I needed to do. I would go to the police station. And I would think, oh, parking is a zoo. It's such a, that is, I'm, not, I'm too busy to do this. But go to the police station, wait in the line, say, I found this. Look at you strange, thinking, why the heck are you handing it in, you know? But you, 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 you hand it in, you fill out the forms, or, or maybe there's an address in it. I found a phone once. It was a little phone, I was in a park, and I went through it, and I found Mum. 
So I called mum. And she said, hello. And I said, oh, excuse me, this is a bit awkward, but you don't know me, but you know, I found this phone. We were able to get the phone back. Now, I know many of us want to do this. But the point is, although we don't have oxes, we, we, we don't steal, we love our neighbour. And I want to show you how this is a model to help us take different laws and think through how they may be applicable to us today. Um, and, and just in case you're being legalistic and thinking, well, you know, that's great if it's someone's sheep and so, uh, someone's ox, but it doesn't say anything about their goat. <laughs> 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 you shall do the same with your neighbor's donkey and you should do the same with your neighbor's garment and you should do the same with everything else that is your neighbor's you shall not withhold your help you shall not see your neighbor's donkey or ox fallen on the road and ignore it you shall lift it up now maybe you've seen these pictures where you get donkeys and they load them up have you seen these things? Maybe you've been in some of these countries. These poor beasts of burden. Huge, huge amounts of stuff they're carrying on their back. And, and what can happen is they're walking and they stumble and they literally topple over. And the only way to help them is to un unload everything, get them upright and load it all up again. And what they're saying is if you see your neighbour in that situation, what you do is you pretend you haven't seen and keep walking. No, what it says is you, you love your neighbour and you stop and you help. And you may not see a donkey, but you may see an elderly lady struggling with her shopping. You may see a mother with four children trying to get stuff in the car. You may see someone else on campus doing do something. You, you get the point here. You see, these are illustrations. And it's all about the kind of society that the God was wanting. And then we come to the passage we have. A woman shall not wear a, woman's, a man's apparel, and a man shall not wear a woman's apparel, for whoever does such things is abhorrent to the Lord your God. Now, the question is, what, what would this have mean? You see, for us today, we have something called fashion fashion wasn't invented back then. I think fashion was invented by companies that want to sell more clothes. So you have to buy more clothes because what you had doesn't, isn't in fashion. Yeah. But it wasn't a thing about fashion. What this almost certainly had to do was uh, the, the pagan religion. And a lot of pagan religion, as you may be aware, was very sexually perverted as you go on through the New Te Old Testament you'll read of what they call houses of, of male cult prostitutes and worshipping these the uh, fertility deities involved all manner of sexual perversion and you would have the whole thing of cross-dressing and homosexuality and that kind of thing and what we have here is an exhortation that you should, uh, you should love the Lord your God by not being involved in idolatry, you see, and it may be, um, it may be, uh, th this exhortation against idolatry is so often in the Old Testament, and so often we can get caught out. Well, we'll talk about that a little bit later. Just a couple more here. If you come on the bird's nest, oh, this is a great one. If you come on a bird's nest in any tree or on the ground and the fledgling eggs and the mother sitting on the fledgling and on the eggs you shall not take the mother with the young let the mother go taking only the young for yourself in order that it may go well with you and you may live long what the heck is that about? <laughs> well what it's saying is again let's try and imagine it you're walking along the road and there's a chicken a wild chicken presumably and you look and you think, oh wow, look, there's a chicken. And you look and this chicken has laid some eggs. And you think, this is fantastic, I've got breakfast and lunch. <laughs> you take the eggs and you have scrambled eggs, you take the chicken and you have deep fried southern chicken. 
<laughs> the only problem with that is there's never going to be any more eggs because you took the chicken and the eggs and what this is saying simply is that when you come along and you see that kind of thing take the eggs but leave the chicken if you leave the chicken there'll be more eggs and those eggs will be for your, your neighbour but if you're selfish and take them both then that's the end one of these laws is a way of possibly a, a way of not stealing but particularly loving your neighbour you love your neighbour and although we don't want to stretch this too far today we're wrestling with things like uh, sustainability we're talking about resources using up resources and if you use up resources there's nothing left for the next generation and, and so you get the at least in microcosm form this kind of attitude where you're considerate about your neighbour in the way you use what you come across we just do one more when you build a new house you shall make a parapet from your roof otherwise you might have blood guilt on your house if anyone should fall from it now very simply in the uh, time in many parts of the world today and then the, your roof was a living space I'm sure you've seen pictures of those uh, stairs up the side of the house and there will be a place in the evening, a nice place to sit uh, in, in many places of the world, it's still like that today isn't it? and what it's saying very simply is when you build your house and you want to live on the roof you build a fence around it and, and I want you to listen to what it says very carefully because it says if there is an accident if you don't do that and there's an accident and someone falls off the roof it is your responsibility you are liable because you see that is your area and, and what, what God is saying if you're going to love your neighbour you don't want to kill them and this is a way you can protect them by making a simple fence so when the kids play up there they don't fall off but if they do fall off you're liable and today of course the whole area of health and safety it is a big part of many countries and it is a very small part of others I remember being so challenged by this the King's Lodge that we're at is it was built in 1870 and so it's uh, quite an old building a lot of style a lot of character but we've had to do a lot of work to bring it all up to scratch with the, the modern uh, responsibilities and codes and it was a number of years ago now but we were told that our fire protection system was not up to scratch and we needed to do it and they told us we needed to renew all of the doors that our students had because they were not fire resistant we had to put an alarm in every room a smoke detector we had to do uh, all these different things and it was thousands and thousands of pounds and of course we wanted to do it but we didn't have the money and so we had uh, we had a good spirit and a good heart and then one day the fire chief for our area came through and he said to us okay the laws have changed I now have power to shut you down if you don't do this I will give you nine months but after nine months I will shut you down uh, and, and he was very generous other places were given a day and so uh, you, you, you guess of course we found the money we took out a loan we did that we put it all in but there was a back part of the building where staff lived and because of the code that didn't fall under the same code and so we didn't do that you know we, we, we took the money and we did everything we needed to do we didn't do that and uh, but we wanted to of course we intended to and so um, uh, but every year the guy who checks the fire alarm he would come and talk to us and and he would say oh by the way that bit out the area that's vulnerable you need to get that properly connected to the system and we thought yeah we do we do <laughs> and we didn't and then one day I was sitting in the dining room and this man came through and he said can I talk to one of the leaders here and I thought well you know I'll do you talk to me 
He said, every year I come through and I check your fire alarm system and every year I check this part out the back there and I tell you that it's not, it's not right and, and every year nothing's been done. Then he said this, don't you care about your staff more than that? You know, God used him to rebuke us. It was a, a rebuke of the Lord. And we got it done very quickly. Uh, because you see, uh, this scripture, what it's talking about is that we take reasonable precautions for the safety of others that are in our particular area. And this will mean different things in different countries. And it will be according to the economy of that country. I was in a base recently in a, a more developing country and I noticed they had whistles and flashlights all around. Uh, but whatever way it is, it's that we, 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 we care for other people. If you've got a seat belt in your car that doesn't work, fix it. You know? These kind of things. Okay, so you can see, I, I hope you can see how we, we have what may see a random law, but when we understand what it's saying, it, it, you can connect it to one of these here. But all of them are connected there. So what I want to do now is, because Deuteronomy is what we're looking at, would you turn to Deuteronomy chapter 19? This is such a fascinating chapter because it's a, a list of uh, people talk about holiness. And what I love about this chapter is the repetition where it's, I am the Lord. I am the Lord. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to all the congregation of the people of Israel and say to them, Yes. So what did I say? Oh, I am so sorry. Thank you. It's Leviticus 19, okay? We're back to, we're back to where I should be. <laughs> Leviticus. Just a marvellous, a marvellous chapter. Because it's in the portion about how we live or how Israel should live as his people that have been set apart. Actually, There we are. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to all of the congregation of the people of Israel and say to them, You shall be holy. For, reason, I the Lord your God and holy. One of the repeated uh, phrases through this is, I am the Lord. I am the Lord your God. I am the Lord your God. I am the Lord. And the whole point here is the reason you should act this way is because you're my people. You will be different because I am different. You will be distinct. In other words, you will not be like the people around. Because I'm not, not like their gods. <laughs> and because I'm different, distinct, separate, you too are my people. You will be like me. God was wanting Israel to reflect him. To reflect himself. I want to say just uh, one or two more things about laws as you're going to be reading so many of them. Firstly, in this chapter, I want you to notice there's no secular sacred divide. It speaks about temple, it speaks about the poor and needy. It speaks about justice, it speaks about idolatry. 
it is, it, 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 there, it, there wasn't a concept in Israel of a secular sacred oh this is this is to do uh, with spiritual stuff this isn't when you read Leviticus it is all, all, all sacred and these laws are too another thing um, just to help you understand ancient law that and I've mentioned this already and that is God didn't give Israel a law about every possible situation but they were examples and the judges as I've said would internalize them and out of that he would make judgments as necessary as a representative of God to the people another thing too and this is really a big one the laws are not necessarily God's highest but they're there because there's a fallen people 